Welcome to the Core Women Podcast, the place for women entrepreneurs, authors, and self-starters looking to build community and gain valuable insights through expert interviews with women at the top of their game. Join your host, podcaster, producer, expert coach, entrepreneur, and author, Dr. Summer Watson, as she aims to inspire and empower you through these candid conversations. Lean in and embrace the journey. It's time to start the show. Here's your host, Dr. Summer Watson. Today on the show, I would like to welcome Dr. Catherine R. Bell, who is a dream work practitioner, is the founder of Experiential Dream Work, Dream Work Coach, and has 11-year history as a space scientist for NASA and a podcast show, The Dream Journal. We have so much to talk about today, so let's do this and welcome Dr. Bell. Thank you so much, Summer, Dr. Watson. I really appreciate being on the show. Oh, I'm so excited to have you here. But before we delve into your professional journey, can you describe your life in one word to this point? Oh, gosh, one word. I think the word has got to be dream. I mean, this has been really the focus of my life and not just nighttime dreams, but also daytime dreams and daydreams and just the mind wandering that happens. There's something about dreaming that just really speaks to me. And, I, you know, my mind just went to like, after we died, do we go off into the dream world? I don't know. But there's like something about dream. Uh, and that has been it has been my uh, salvation. Can I use that word? <laughs> there's okay. a way that they really led me that my dreams just really led me out of where I was into a much better place. Can you delve into that a little bit more? Let's talk about that. Let's unfold that a little bit and talk about where you were and where you are today. Absolutely. So I have was raised by a bunch of scientists. Like my parents are both scientists. All three of my siblings are in science. And so science seemed like it was really the way I, to go. And so I was very much sculpted by expectations. And I think most of us are really, we're, we're raised in expectation, immersed in expectations. And we don't really taught to look within. We aren't really taught, well, so what do you want, dear? You know, it's more like, can you um, play quietly with your siblings so I can cook dinner? And so, uh, you know, I was not really taught to inquire within or to pay attention to my feelings. And I didn't know that that was important. And as of a bunch of scientists, I was taught about thinking and making decisions and pros and cons. And so I didn't really know to follow my feelings. That, that was a new thing. And in fact, I thought feelings were more or less something to be squelched in order to uh, get me to where I was supposed to go. And so the, uh, um, I found myself in a marriage that was uh, not going so well. Not, I was not expressing my needs. It was causing problems with a relationship, but I kept squelching my needs and going, well, whatever he wants must be the right thing to do. Um, and we had a child. And when a child was one year old, I was up in Oregon on a windsurfing vacation. And my husband was not with me. He said he had to stay home because a back issue. But I kind of knew some level other things were going on that I didn't want to know about. So while I was in the mode of suppressing who I was, um, I um, got this pain in my gut. And the pain got worse and worse over a few days, but I was taking care of our baby. And I was I was so busy suppressing my emotional feelings that I thought, oh, this is, I don't need to pay attention to this feeling. And after three and a half days, my appendix ruptured and I nearly died. Um, mm -hmm. Luckily, the person I was with got me to a hospital. I survived, but the doctor was like, you know, you got to pay attention to those feelings. And, and it was a huge, huge wake up call. And I realized how much of my life had been suppressing my feelings, both the emotions and the sensations. They're kind of the same in many ways and just suppressing who I was. And uh, I found that my dreams were leading me out and that I had already been interested in dreaming. I'd been in a group for, or for maybe 10 years, a dream group, exploring my own dreams and had 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 a lot of really revelations around that. But after my appendix ruptured and I survived, and it was a long time to recover from that, I found that my dreams were getting very specific uh, about um, the ways that I was stuck. And I found some people to work with with my dreams. And I found that I was starting to learn about my own truth 
who am I? Like I can decide this is what I want to do. This is what I'm going to do. And I can do all the affirmations in the world to get me to the point of, of going to do that. But if that's not what I really want to do, what I really, my core self wants to do, then it's not going to lead me to a place of happiness. Right. Yeah. So, so making myself realize that that was important, that my satisfaction and the feeling that something feels good when I'm going towards it is valuable was a kind of a new thing that, that my feelings mattered and the dreams were what really led me there. Well, that's really interesting. And I'm going to take a couple of steps back here, Dr. Bell, because I want to really tap into for just a moment that departure from feelings and emotions or being able to identify those feelings and emotions and really just tapping into those. Because a lot of times I'll be working with either children and adults and we'll put up that chart with all the feelings. And we'll do that because a lot of times people don't even know what they're feeling or don't even know how to put a name to it. So when did you start feeling like, not only can I put a name to this, but I can actually talk about it and embrace it because as scientists, as clinicians, we haven't been taught to really do that. Mm -hmm. And so you were conditioned a certain way as you talked about. So How did that develop? Was it your dreams being able to help you, support you in a way that you could identify those feelings and emotions? You could embrace them and say, I'm worthy. I want to do something I'm passionate about and love. What was that for you? When were you able to do that during your your process? Putting a name to a feeling is is incredibly valuable in helping to understand what's going on. And what I found, though, was most helpful was putting an image to a feeling. Mm. And that's where the dreams come in. Ah, interesting. Yep. Yes. And there's um, there's a whole line of people who, all the way back to Carl Jung, who talk about dreams as giving the image of a feeling, of the image of what's going on in your psyche right now. Like there's one early dream that I had when I was getting into my in-depth dream work where I'm in this castle, a cold gray castle high up on a hill. And I'm going to bed, I'm laying on on this bed and I'm trying to pull up a blanket. I'm pulling up this blanket and it's horrible. It's crinkly. It's like cellophane. And it's like, it's not helping me be warm. It's just uncomfortable, but I'm trying to comfort myself. And this dream was just this one image. And yet it was incredibly valuable of recognizing number one, what I live is living in a castle really defended and alone and cold and like really needing something and then trying to warm myself, trying to comfort myself. And with this, this crinkly, uncomfortable feeling. And it's like, like, first of all, I think, Oh, well, my bed is perfectly comfortable. I, you know, I, I've got this nice mattress and (laughs) you know, this is not my bed is, it seems to be just fine. So maybe there's something metaphorical here. And I recognized that it was more my, uh, my emotional state was Mm -hmm. feeling, kind of cold and crinkly and not comforting me. Like I didn't know how to comfort myself. And so this image really described very precisely how uncomfortable I was in waking life. And so uh, like during the day when I could feel uh, that I'm uncomfortable, I could go back to that image and go, yeah, but I'm trying to comfort myself. I'm pulling up the blanket and trying to comfort myself. And I just don't know how. And so the sense of being uncomfortable you know, I could say uncomfortable, that's an emotion or a sensation. And yet this detailed image of in a castle trying to comfort myself with a cold crinkly blanket was much more exactly the feeling that I was feeling. And I found that dreams are very often pictures of feelings. In fact, that's one valuable way of approaching a dream. It's like, well, what is this? This this doesn't look like anything logical. And yet if you go into the dream and feel what that moment felt like, and look at the creatures in the in the dream as somehow showing myself what's true for me right now, I can get a lot of really big ahas. I may not know what it means, but I know, oh, I know that feeling. I recognize that. Sometimes a good feeling, sometimes a bad feeling. But that image, then is something I can carry around with me. And then when I have that feeling, instead of being frustrated, I go, oh, yeah, it's just like that castle. And I'm trying to comfort myself, but I don't know how. From there, how do you translate that into an action to actually make a change Mm -hmm. in your life? How do you apply that? Now you've identified the feeling or the condition, and now you can embrace that and say, I'm going to use this 
So how does that translate into change? Uh, well, I have found that the the most useful thing is to accept the feeling the way it is. And there's like a Carl Rogers thing of unconditional acceptance. And it seems like you're crazy. This is the feeling I'm going to accept. And yet somehow bringing, and I, I like to use the word tenderness, like bringing the sense of tenderness. Like, yes, I'm feeling really uncomfortable right now. And I don't want to be feeling this way. I want to be happy. I want to feel a sense of purpose. But I can bring this tenderness. It's like, gosh, I'm trying. God, I'm trying so hard. And like bringing this, like imagining a, a little girl who who is trying really hard, like imagining somebody out, a friend of yours. Like if you see them struggling with things, you have a great deal of tenderness and compassion for them. Can you bring that tenderness and compassion to yourself? That's not easy. It wasn't easy for me. And I have found that th this is a huge step to bringing a tenderness and compassion and letting myself rest. I actually have this kind of formalism I like to use, which is TLC, mm -hmm. tenderness, longing, and curiosity. So like, ten like tender, loving cares, tenderness mm -hmm. to yourself, and then bring a sense of longing, like, where would I rather be? Like, where am I, what am I longing for? So I'm still in this place of discomfort, of not being satisfied, but what am I longing for? And I can start to picture what I might be reaching for without making a big definition of what has to look like X, Y, and Z, just I'm longing for a sense of comfort. I'm longing for companionship. I'm longing for a sense of purpose in life. Like that longing without needing to know what that specific is can be very valuable. And then curiosity, like, huh, I wonder what's over there. I wonder following the curiosity or, or looking at the images of the dreams with curiosity, looking at myself with curiosity could bring in compassion there too, again. So tenderness, longing, and curiosity are ways to work with these images that allow me to start moving forward. Like I have a longing and then I could be curious, like what kind of a topic might I be interested in? So the curiosity can help me explore where I'm going. I love that because I really appreciate what you said about being present and being in the moment and being okay with accepting that feeling. I believe that it's important to give ourselves that opportunity in that time to be in that moment, to feel it, to not run away from it, to experience it. I'll give you an example. This is kind of an odd example, but when Eddie Van Halen passed away, I never, <laughs> I, never I, know, I, know, I don't really get choked up when I'm like, oh my gosh, somebody's passed away. But for some reason, some reason, I couldn't shake it. I couldn't shake it. And I thought to myself, man, nothing really gets me down. This kind of gets me down. Mm -hmm. And I had to stay in that feeling for a minute. And I said, I'm going to give myself permission to be here. Nice. I'm going to give myself permission to be here because I need to figure this out. I need to figure out why I'm feeling this way. And I did. And it connected back to a time in my life that I really appreciated. I was having a lot of fun. That music was part of my life. And it just felt like such a departure, such a loss. Mm -hmm. And it was a longing. And I was just like, oh, okay. Now that I know where this is coming from, now that I'm in this for a minute and I'm allowing myself to be here and giving myself permission, there's a lot of times we don't. We don't. And we just keep running and we just keep going and we just keep passing by and we miss things. And so by doing that, and again, I say this is a, a kind of an odd example, but it was an example that it stuck with me. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I gave myself a day. Beautiful. And I think when you talk about this, this TLC, this this longing, this curiosity, being okay to be in that moment and then being curious about why and then digging a little deeper, mm -hmm. it might feel uncomfortable. But when you start coming up with like ah, the ha ha moment, yeah. then you can start moving and doing something about it. Yeah. And so this is what I love about what you're talking about. That TLC is perfect. And it's a perfect example of how we can actually practically approach things and how we feel mm -hmm. our emotions. With that said, you have studied science. Mm -hmm. You've worked for NASA as a space scientist. Mm -hmm. You've transitioned into doing some dream work, a lot of dream work, actually. So how did these two come together? How mm -hmm. do they they pair? Well, I'm still a scientist, you know, mm -hmm. I, yes. I'm just, I'm just a science a scientist of the dream world instead of, yeah. you know, I, I studied the formation of stars and planets. And that was a very interesting 
topic, but it just wasn't satisfying. It was you know, an example of how I can be good at something and yet it's not good for me. And that was just a stunningly beautiful example, Summer, of what you described there um, with Van Halen, that you could, this can be applied to waking life moments. It doesn't have to. So maybe I don't remember my dreams. Not everybody remembers dreams, but waking life moments apply as well. And as I was working for NASA, I was just not satisfied. It was got got to be more and more uh, disappointing, and I I got promoted to being an administrator because <laughs> I wasn't being very productive in my astronomy. And it, but it turned out that that was a good thing because I discovered I like to work with people. Who knew? You know, in my family where we're all very straight laced and buttoned down and very rational scientific beings, and I'm not. I'm a people person, and I discovered that about myself that I like to work with people. I like to help them with whatever they need help with. So when I had my child, I quit my job and I I was like, what? So now what? And my marriage was falling apart. And the one an- biggest, the biggest anchor in my life was that dream group that I had been part of for so many years. And dreams have been meaningful for me since a child. I have childhood dreams that I still treasure. And there was something that just kept leading me through the way. And as I started to have dreams about working with other people, and their dreams. And I'm like, oh, really? Is that what's going to happen here? <laughs> well, I was going to ask you, yeah. as you were working for NASA, as these changes were were happening yeah. within you, were you having dreams? Oh, were yeah. You, were you listening to those dreams? I was having them and I was in this group, which was a valuable thing, but it was a uh, it was just kind of pattering away at the surface. It didn't really kind of get in deep until I had that crisis around my ruptured appendix when I'm like, something really big has got to change. It was just like, but like those dreams, the dreams were like usually in black and white and there was like wars and battles. I would see like a battlefield from above. I would look down from like, you know, a thousand feet up and look down and there'd be these wars going on with, you know, soldiers with swords and, and, uh, and horses uh, attacking each other. and But I was like very removed from this. I think I was very removed from my own crisis, from my own predicament. Yeah. And so I did have a lot of dreams and I was paying attention to them and I'd bring them to the group and we'd talk about them. And and, and like, yeah, this is very meaningful, but it, it took some time. I think that was part of it. It just took some time for, for things to start to penetrate. It's interesting that they were about these battles and maybe this internal struggle you yes. were going through. And then, you know, to be able to, I wouldn't say sever, but separate yeah. a little bit from, it's okay not to want this. It's right. okay not to want to do this anymore. <laughs> and I think because we've been so conditioned and, and what was modeled for you for so many years, it becomes part of that fabric from yeah. which you, and those roots from which you grew. And so it's really interesting as you talk about your dreams, your life, those transitions, it all comes together really well. Let's talk more about how you work with clients to explore their dreams, do dream work analysis, and what this means in relation to our subconscious and our conscious state as it relates to our dreams. There's kind of a whole self-help culture, or not even self-help, but like a coaching culture where uh, where I want to help somebody improve their life. And they may have all these ideas about how their life should be improved. And that's great because that brings you to the place of getting help. And help is a big step when you start to reach out for someone else to say, okay, I can't do this on my own. I need some help. And yet what I find is that the dreams have a certain truth that the waking mind doesn't always have access to. The way that like I was so separated from these battles that were going on during the time I was working at NASA that I was I was too far away. I couldn't really see what was going on. And yet I knew something was happening. I have a hard time with dream incubation. Like I go to sleep worrying about some problem with, uh, with my, with my business. Maybe I'm worried about the dream journal, my next podcast episode or something. But when I go, go to sleep, I wake up in the morning, it's all about my relationship and like, Oh, okay. This is something I need to pay attention to. This is important. And so the dreams seem to touch into the deeper part of who I am. And so if someone brings me a dream, we'll read the dream together. And then I'll just ask the dreamer to consider, is this meaningful to you in your life? And is this something that um, is important to you? Is there something coming up here that uh, that maybe you haven't really considered before or not, or not deeply or something that 
that, that there's more coming out here because you know when it comes to like an affirmation or an setting an intention it's like i might have these ideas about what i need and they may be true like yes i need a sense of peace but how to get there is not so clear. And the dreams often will provide information about how to how to get there. So one of the things I do with the treasure hunt, which is a, this book I'm working on now, I'm in the editing phase. I'm so excited. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I know. It's been a huge project and I love it. But the idea of the treasure hunt, dreams of treasure hunt, is looking for those moments within the dream that are golden moments. There are mm-hmm. moments in, in pretty much every dream where there's some even sense of relief like there's like the, for me the dream about the castle with covering myself with the blanket is the golden moment was the recognizing that i'm wanting to comfort myself i'm trying to comfort myself and so there's a sense that i know what comfort is so it seems kind of remote and yet there's some way that i know what comfort is and that is a gift because i'm like oh because a lot so often in waking life i'm just frustrated in a hurry and at the time i had a young child and i was constantly uh triggered (laughs) challenging for me (laughs) so yeah there's something about looking for the treasure in the dream that is always there and then of course recognizing the dream itself is a treasure even if it's a nightmare even if it's a negative a scary dream that there's somehow this is a gift and so starting with that that uh, perspective that there's something valuable going on here, and it doesn't have to be even a literal dream, like many people don't remember their dreams. But like what you said about that Van Halen, that when he passed away, something spoke to you about that. And so even a waking life moment, like our scene from a movie, if it's something that speaks to you, then there's something valuable there. Right. You know, the, looking for those treasures, looking for those those moments or you know, there may be eventually there's moments in my dream where I did find comfort and I do find relationship and maybe it's only a second and then I run away. Like I, I get a nice hug from somebody and then next, next thing I'm, I'm running away and trying to fill my backpack or catch the airplane, typical dream themes of mine. But there was that moment when I had a hug and can I go back to that moment of comfort and, and beauty and recognize that it is possible for me to feel these things and that I have had this moment of beauty. So looking for the treasures is really one of the key ways that I recommend people work with their life. It's a bit like a gratitude practice in waking life. Mm, it's so much value here. Thank you so much for sharing. You know, there's so much more that we could tap into here yeah. in regards to daydreaming. Yeah. What that means is that disassociation or is your brain taking a break? I mean, there's so much to talk about here because mm-hmm. when I was a kid, my parents used to go, hey, you're daydreaming again. <laughs> yes. Oh, no. <laughs> you're, you're daydreaming. <laughs> and there's reasons for it. And I can identify now. However, we all have our reasons. And I love what you talk about here. We covered so much. We can delve into so much more. I might need to have you back. But as we come to the close of the interview today, my last question for you is, if you were to leave the listeners with a tip to create a journey they love, what would it be? Mm, Look for the treasures. Look for the treasure, including the treasures of recognizing your own feelings including the treasures of allies uh, in waking life and allies in dreams, looking for the the treasures of even recognizing that something is not working out. Because sometimes we, we can persist in a path because of momentum, because we think we should, and then we suddenly realize this isn't working out. And that's a gift to suddenly have that aha, those aha moments. You mentioned aha moments. Yeah, aha a, moments. Yes, yeah. it's, a well, it's, a, it's kind of a dream formalism. And yet here, it's also very valuable in waking life. Is there insight, like a moment of, oh, insight? Whatever that insight is about, there's something really valuable there. And so trusting yourself, trusting your feelings, trusting your gut, trusting the flow around you, that can be really helpful. So many great tips and so much wisdom here. Thank you so much, Dr. Bell, for joining me on the Core Women podcast today. Thank you, Dr. Watson. This is a real pleasure. You can follow Dr. Catherine R. Bell on Instagram at Experiential Dream Work, on Facebook at Catherine Bell, and at her podcast, The Dream Journal. And then you can also follow her at experientialdreamwork.com. Thank you for joining us on the Core Women Podcast with Dr. Summer Watson. We're so glad you're here and would love to connect more with you. Find us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Core Women and on Twitter at Core Women One. For more about Core Women and Dr. Watson, visit corewomen.com. 
Want more support and resources for amazing women like you? Great! Join Dr. Watson and Jen Fontanilla at the Life, Love & Money Collective, a core women production that aids in understanding the key traits that might be getting in the way of living a life that you are absolutely passionate about. Connect with Summer and Jen and find out more at thelifeloveandmoney.com.